Hello everyone and welcome to IntelliPack. In this video, we will be learning about distributed system. In almost all the tech interviews that are going on right now, distributed systems is a concept that comes up very often. It is a very vast and complex subject. But you are expected to know the basic concept about it to crack the interview. You will learn whatever is needed for the interview in this video. Before we move on, make sure that you subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit the bell icon to get the regular updates. Now let us take a look at the agenda for the video. Firstly, I'll be explaining about the introduction to distributed systems. We'll be taking a look at the history of distributed systems, followed by what exactly is a distributed system. And after that, we'll be taking a look at a concept called middleware in distributed systems. And after that, we'll be taking a look at a case study, which is for blockchain. And after that, we'll be taking a look at certain pros and cons of distributed systems. And finally, we'll be taking a look at the most basic theorem in distributed systems, which is the CAP theorem. Let us uh, move on to the first topic, which is introduction. So uh, since the 1945 uh, to 1985, computers were generally uh, very large and expensive, as you can see in the picture below. So it needed a whole room to just uh, have a basic working computer. So the early day computers or the first generation computers, they used something called as vacuum tubes and vacuum tubes were very large. They were used to store data and uh, make computations on this data. So the, as you can see, they were very large and it needed a large uh, amount of them. The olden day computers, they needed a large amount of vacuum tubes uh, to do the basic tasks. So and then after that, all of this changed after the development of a powerful microprocessor. Uh, what you see in the image uh, is the Intel 4004. It was among one among the early uh, microprocessors to be developed. Uh, this uh, started in mid 1980s, uh, 85, 86 and so on. So uh, every major company started manufacturing microprocessors. So the size of the computers generally became uh, smaller after the invention of microprocessors. And th this was the first breakthrough, that is the invention of microprocessors was the first breakthrough in uh, computing. And then the second breakthrough came uh, when uh, the invention of high speed computer networks took place. And uh, parallel to this, uh, parallel to the first and second uh, uh, breakthroughs, uh, we had another breakthrough. Uh, you cannot call it as a big breakthrough. It is just called as an evolution of the computers uh, due to the um, result of these first and uh, second breakthroughs. So what was this uh, um, end pro byproduct of the uh, evolution? This was the miniaturization of computer systems. So in present times in 2022, we can see uh, laptops, uh, we can see tablets and we can see hybrids between uh, tablets and laptops and you can see uh, top-notch uh, mobile phones which is pretty much hit saturation like we have almost uh, perfected the smartphone um, industry right now and then you also have um, portable uh, desktop portable computing or uh, like the Mac mini and the Intel's uh, NUC uh, you don't even have to own a, a desktop now you can just uh, it will be a size of a power brick and you can just carry it uh, and it will have all the slots. You can just connect your monitor, mouse, keyboard, whatever. And then you can set up your desktop anywhere. So you have portable desktops as well. So we have all these miniaturization of all the computer devices and all the form factors. This was the result of uh, high speed computer networks and then uh, the invention of microprocessors. These computers, that is the nodes, uh, can be geographically dispersed, uh, for which reason they are usually said to form a distributed system. Alright, so because of all these three improvements, that is the microprocessor technology, the networking and miniaturization of computers, it is now easy to put together a computer system composed of a large number of computer networks. So. These uh, computer networks uh, have nodes and these nodes can be geographically dispersed for which reason they are usually said to form a distributed system. Uh, we have the centralized uh, network, computer network, uh, 
wherein one centralized server or a computer sits in at the center and then uh, it is connected to every other node uh, when coming to the decentralized architecture you have um, the uh, centralized uh, nature is taken out and uh, it is split into many uh, central bodies and these central bodies will have uh, connections uh, physical connections or wireless connections to other nodes so basically every nodes will be connected uh, but you will still have a uh, uh, one node which is telling the other nodes what to do that is in decentralized uh, you still have some form of control uh, you still have some form of centralization but when it comes to distributed every node is connected to every other node and every other adjacent node uh, and then no no one owns the network and no one has control of the network uh, basically every node is given equal rights so this is what distributed means and one more point i have to ha add here is that distributed systems are highly dynamic now what do you mean by dynamic it means that computers can join and leave and they can adapt to changing topology and performance uh, that is uh, any number of computers uh, or nodes can be add join uh, can join the distributed network and they can leave at any point or oh, this will not affect the overall network and then each node can adapt to changing topology topology here means the physical layout of the network and then performance also it can adapt to performance as well so that is why it is called dynamic now that we know how distributed systems came into picture, uh, why it was created and what are all the factors that uh, caused uh, the invention or the uh, formation of a distributed system. Uh, now uh, let us move on to the uh, explanation or uh, we will see what exactly is a distributed system in this topic. Now the formal definition of distributed systems goes something like this. Um, it is basically like defining a distributed system is very tough all right so this is uh, somewhat a loose characterization of what a distributed system is so uh, anywhere uh, you find if, even if you google what is a distributed system like there is no hard and fast uh, definition to it so this is a loose characterization uh, that is taken from one of the credible textbooks uh, by andrew tannenbaugh so he says uh, a distributed system is a collection of autonomous computing elements that appears to its users as a single coherent system. Now let's break down this definition. So basically um, this note that uh, uh, definition refers to two characteristic features of distributed systems. So it says it's a collection of autonomous computing elements. Now what do you mean by autonomous computing elements? Uh, so Autonomous means that it is independent of uh, other uh, nodes in the network. That is, a single computer in the network can be independent of any other uh, computers. So that is what uh, you mean by autonomous. And computing elements uh, is called as a node here. So the general term is a node. A node can be a person using a computer, that is a user, uh, like using a physical actual computer, or a node can also be an application running in a computer. That is, um, let's say if within a computer there are several applications running, so you will have to uh, address each application as a node. And then uh, the second uh, characteristic feature uh, that is defined in this definition is single coherent system. Now, what do you mean by single coherent system? Uh, this means that one way or another, uh, the autonomous nodes needs to collaborate, right? So, in order for the user uh, to believe that the network is a single system, uh, all the nodes within that distributed system needs to act like it is one system. So, for that, it needs to collaborate in some fashion. So, this is what it means by a uh, single coherent system. So let me give you some examples of a distributed system right now. Facebook. Facebook is a distributed system. Uh, blockchain uh, technology, uh, whatever the applications of blockchain is right now, is uh, distributed systems. And then uh, online uh, multiplayer games like Counter-Strike, uh, Dota 2, etc. are all distributed systems. 
Now let us go through some of the most uh, important functions of distributed computing. Let us see what they are. So the very first function is resource sharing. So in order to be a distributed system, uh, you will have to share resources among other nodes. Whether it is uh, hardware, whether it is software or data, you, you will have to share your uh, data among, uh, you will have to share your resource among other nodes, your uh, um, adjacent nodes. And then the next uh, feature or function is openness. Openness here means that how open is the software design uh, to be developed and shared with each other. This means that uh, if a software is developed by using uh, the distributed network, it has to be open. There must be transparency in the software. And the next function is concurrency. Concurrency here means that multiple machines can process the same function at the same time. So uh, let's say you want uh, you are in a distributed system and one node um, is downloading something and the, the, uh, some other node uh, should be able to download the same thing at the same time. This is what you mean by concurrency. And moving on to the next function, we have scalability. Scalability means uh, how the computing and processing capabilities multiply when extended to many machines. So let me break this down. Uh, let's say you have a you have 10 nodes in a distributed uh, network. You buy 10 nodes and then you uh, form a distributed network through these 10 nodes. Uh, so you have a software, you create a software and you deploy it on uh, uh, the network, uh, one of the nodes in the network and everybody can access the uh, software. Now you want to increase the network, um, that is increase the population of the network by adding in 90 more nodes. Let's say now the uh, node size, like the number of nodes in the distributed network is 100. So uh, now the software has to work in the same manner. That is, it has to give out the same functionalities in the same amount of time uh, with no lag, no issues, no latency uh, for the 100 nodes as well. So this is what you call as scalability. So this is one of the functions or features of um, distributed systems. Next, we move on to fault, tol fault tolerance. Uh, fault tolerance here means that how easy and quickly can uh, failures in parts of the system can be detected and recovered. So let's say a system, a group of nodes go down and uh, the data or uh, uh, software in that nodes should be duplicated in some other node so that you can, so that the data or the software can be retrieved. So uh, fault tolerance is one of the features. And finally, we have transparency. Uh, transparency here means that how much uh, access does one node have to locate and communicate with other nodes in the system. Uh, so every node is treated as the same here. Um, every node is allowed access to whatever data, whatever software, uh, whatever hardware resource that is there in the distributed uh, network. So it has to be transparent. Although you can give... Um, like you can set uh, user uh, authentication or uh, user access uh, within the distributed uh, networks. That is, uh, you can cut off certain uh, uh, functions for a particular node or a group of nodes. That can be done uh, through software. But generally, um, uh, the distributed uh, system is transparent. All right, now let us move on to the next uh, section which is middleware in distributed systems. All right, uh, as you can see in the picture now, this picture is taken from uh, the textbook Distributed Systems by Andrew Tannenbaugh. And this figure represents a distributed system organized in a middleware layer, which extends over multiple machines offering each application the same interface. Now, when you look closely uh, in the image or the figure, it shows four computers, that is computer one, two, three, and four, of which application B, uh, so you have three applications here, uh, application A, B, and C. And now application B um, is distributed across computers two and three. Each application is offered the same interface, that is application A, B, and C uh, communicates to the computers or the nodes through the same layer called as the distributed system layer or 
middleware layer. The distributed system provides the means for components, components or nodes of a single distributed application to communicate with each other but also to let different applications communicate. That is the applications can communicate between themselves when you have something called as a middleware layer. At the same time, it hides as best and reasonably as possible the differences in hardware and operating systems from each application. So let's say a software engineer creates uh, uh, application A, some other set of software engineers create B and uh, some other set of uh, engineers create application C. So no, uh, now they have um, they have to take into account each node. That is, each node might have a different uh, operating system. They might have different hardware configuration as well. So this becomes very complex for the engineers, software engineers, to develop applications which are especially catered to each and every node. So instead of that, if you put a distributed system layer or a middleware layer. Uh, they can, they should only worry about what the middleware layer is, what it brings to the table and what you have to cater to the middleware so that you can communicate to the to all the nodes. So they only have to worry about the middleware uh, uh, rules and regulations so that they can create applications uh, without having to worry about the operating system and the hardware uh, of each and every node. So this is why you need something called as a middleware in a distributed network. In a sense, uh, you can also say that uh, middleware is the same to a distributed system as an operating system is to a computer. It is a manager of resources offering its applications to efficiently share and deploy those resources across a network. So he's saying that uh, he's basically paralleling out the middleware and the operating system. He says that uh, it is the middleware can be considered as the operating system of a single uh, node. Now let us move on to the next topic, which is blockchain. All right, guys. Now let us take a look at a case study uh, which uses distributed systems, which is blockchain. So blockchain technology, as you might have heard in the news or in some tech forums, Everybody are talking about blockchain right now and it has become famous due to uh, something called as cryptocurrencies. Uh, you might have heard about Bitcoin, Ethereum, etc. So all these uh, cryptocurrencies uh, use blockchain as their underlying architecture. Now uh, we will take a look at how block blockchain is uh, developed using distributed systems concepts. There are mainly two types of architectures in distributed computing. Uh, the first one is the client server architecture. Uh, basically, you have one server serving all the clients um, through uh, the internet, which is called as client server architecture. And then you have peer to peer, uh, which also uses internet, but uh, uh, it uses the uh, peer to peer network as an overlay network over on top of the internet. So that is what you call by peer to peer and uh, there is no single server. So everyone ha acts as a server, everyone acts as a client. Some of the advantages of this architecture, that is the peer to peer architecture. So blockchain uses peer to peer uh, out of the two architectures I've shown here, client server and peer to peer. Blockchain uses peer to peer. Now let us take a look at some of the advantages of peer to peer architecture. Uh, the first one is that it can be easily configured and installed. All the nodes, the second one is that all the nodes in the network are capable of sharing resources and information with other nodes present in the network. That is every node is treated as the same and you can communicate with uh, each and every node in the distributed network. Even if any node goes down, it does not affect the whole system. So even if your data um, is in one node, it will be shared among other nodes. The data will be split up and uh, all the parts of the data will be stored in some of the some or the other node and you can collect that particular data from all of the nodes in the network so the fourth advantage is uh, maintaining and building such an architecture is comparatively cost effective blockchain technology works on the principle of uh, p2p architecture that is peer to peer architecture 
which helps the technology to be more secure and efficient. Blockchain technology can be used in many industries, but the main highlight where it is mostly used are cryptocurrencies, as I've talked before. A P2P network is central when it comes to doing a transaction within a blockchain. All the nodes can transact with each other in the blockchain. Now, all the P2P networks are decentralized. And that is why blockchain is also known as decentralized applications. This characteristic makes blockchain more secure and hard to hack or break into. In P2P networks, limitations come into the picture when the size of the network grows, which results in performance, security and accessibility within the network. Now, let us take a look at some of the disadvantages of this architecture. The first one is that it has no centralized entity to manage all the network operations. And the second one is that backup should be done on each computer network. Moving on to the third disadvantage. As any node can be accessed anytime in order for that network, security is applied to each node individually. So there, there is a bit of security concern here, meaning that uh, security should be applied to each of the node individually. But uh, we have workarounds uh, around this disadvantage. Now let us move on to the pros and cons of distributed systems. So coming to the pros of distributed systems, the ultimate goal of a distributed system is to enable the scalability, performance and high availability of applications. So the very first pro is unlimited horizontal scaling, uh, which means that uh, machines or nodes can be added wherever required. The second pro is that it provides low latency. Having machines that are geographically located closer to the users, it will reduce the time it takes for the uh, users to be served. The final pro is that it is fault tolerance. If one server or data center goes down, others could still serve the users of that service. Coming to the cons of distributed systems, every engineering decision has trade-offs. Complexity is the biggest disadvantage of distributed systems. There are more machines, more messages, more data being passed between more parties, which leads to issues with uh, these three things, which are uh, data integration and consistency. It basically means that being able to synchronize the order of changes to data and states of the application. And next we have uh, network and communication failure. So messages may not be delivered to the right nodes or in the incorrect order, uh, which may lead to a breakdown in communication and functionality. So maintaining network and communications in a distributed systems is very complex. Finally, we have management overhead. So with uh, this con, uh, you have more intelligence uh, monitoring, logging and load balancing functions needed to be added for uh, visibility into the operation and failures of the distributed systems. So now that the pros and cons are clear, uh, let us move on to the last topic of this video, which is the cap theorem. So cap theorem, as I've said, it is the most basic and useful theorem when it comes to learning and designing a distributed system. So if anybody here wants to develop or learn a distributed system, uh, you will have to know about uh, cap theorem. Let us see what cap theorem is in in a gist, like uh, we'll just know about it very briefly. Cap stands for consistency, availability and partition tolerance. So C stands for consistency, A stands for availability and P here stands for partition tolerance. So as I've discussed consistency and availability uh, and partition tolerance in the first topic. Uh, so now the cap theorem says that when a network partition happens, you should have to choose between consistency and availability. You can never have both. So this is what the cap theorem says. All right, guys, that's it from my side. Thank you for watching till the end. Have a nice day. Just a quick info, guys. IntelliPad provides full stack web development course in collaboration with ENICT IIT Guwahati. The course link of which is given in the description below.